Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, this is, the, again, the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. Um, this is a time of celebration, a time for us to lift up the name of Jesus Christ. Um, I know last week I was not um, able to go live. And uh, for those who um, usually come in or those who tap in, um, I thank God for you. I've gotten some um, some emails or some texts saying, hey, you know, we missed you. And so I just thank God for you. Um, but we have so many things going on. And so I just was not able to to go live. Um, still ministered. We still ministered last week and still able to go forward. Just had so many things going on. Uh, good morning, Pastor D. Uh, um, much love to you and your family and your ministry. Um, but I had to come on today and I'm excited about ministering the word uh, because it, it's something about the name of Jesus. Um, and I know we had uh, many have sung songs about it, but it's something about the name of Jesus that gets me excited and um, gets me going forward. So today, as always, I'm bringing glad tidings from the House of Prayer Evangelistic Church where we are located at 2940 North 17th Street. That's in Kansas City, Kansas. And our pastor is Bernard Crawford Jr. And our first lady, Prophetess Trina Crawford. Uh, again, angels of this edifice, great, wonderful people. And again, right now the doors are open. We're, um, you know, those that want to come out and just, whether you want to join or not, or you just want to come and fellowship, this is the place um, that I, we, we are, are a church who loves you, that loves no matter who you are or how you are. Uh, we want to love the H-E-L-L -L out of you, is what we always say, because we love you that much. Today, I want to talk about uh, the what God has really given me today to talk about, because it, um, one of the things I realized in my life is um, I've done a lot, and I've done a lot of good, and I've done a lot of bad. Um, but one of the things that I've, I wanted to always do is line up with, with, with God and with his ways and his will. And when I look at today and I look at where we are today, sometimes we get off, um, whether it's parenting, whether it's ministry, whether it's church, whether it's teaching, whether it's at work, wherever we are, school, um, sometimes we still get off. And I want to be a person, I want to be a man that when we look back or when I look at, at back or someone looks back at me, they can say, he was a man after God's own heart. Or she was a woman when we have friends or we have our wives or our friends that are living for God. She was a woman of God's heart. And today that's what we want to talk about. A man after God's own heart. A man or woman after God's own heart. There are several ways for us to get to this place. It's not always easy, but it's the best. And when we line up this way, um, it really get, brings the joy. It brings joy to the Lord. And so today I want to talk about a man after God's own heart. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you again through the rain, through all of the things that we're going through, through the troubles of our lives, Lord. You have kept us. Lord, even through the deaths, through the mourning, through the through all of the pain, God, that we have endured, Lord, you are still yet there. And so we thank you. Lord, we thank you that you have never left us nor forsake us, forsaken us, God. You have kept us and you have strengthened us even in the times. Lord, we thank you that you have covered us and you have protected us and you have kept us for these times as this. Lord, I'm asking, Lord, that you would continue to be God and, and that we'd be your children, Lord, and that you continue to go before us and that you send your angels that come out around us, that they'll go before us, Lord, and keep us as we go this journey, this Christian journey. Lord, I'm asking that you would touch the unbeliever, touch the one who has fallen off, the backslider. Lord, I'm asking that you would touch the one who is feeling like that, that, that things are not justified that their lives just doesn't matter, that their lives are corrupt or they feel some way, God. Touch them right now in the name of Jesus. Touch the hurt, even touch the church hurt, the one who is going through that process. Lord, I'm asking that you would lift them up right now and that they, you would bring them back to your fold. God, we love you today. Lord, I'm asking that you would touch our youth and touch our children, touch the surrounding counties in this, this nation. Lord, that they would come back to you, their first love. We thank you for it all, and it's in Jesus' name that we pray and give thanks. Amen. 
So today we want to really get down to the nitty gritty. We want to talk about a man or woman of God's own heart. Now, when we think about Jesus and we look about the Lord and we think about how he views us, people, uh, there's a difference between how the Lord looks at us and how we look at people. So people tend to judge the character and the worth of others by looking at the outward appearances. If a person was tall or good looking or well built and tastefully dressed, then he or she, they, they possess physical qualities that most people admire or respect. And that's how we look in the world. You know, we look at these things, but guess what? But often these are the physical qualities we seek in a leader. So these are some of the things we see in a leader as well. But God has the unique ability to see the inside of a person. He has the quality. Let me turn this volume up because somebody said it sounds like I'm low. Sorry about that. Hope y'all can hear me out there. But we, as we look at what's going on today, we have to look at what, how God judges us and how he looks at us. God has the unique ability to see the inside person. God knows our true character because he looks at our heart. Can y'all hear me out there? I just want to, if somebody can hear me, I just want to make sure that my volume's up. I want to make sure that you can still hear me today. So the deal is, is, is we need to know that God looks at the heart versus looking at the, the, these great attributes or how cute we are, how this, God doesn't look at us in that form. God looks at us in a whole different level. And so guess what? God is wanting us to have the same heart. He wants us to have the same, the same way that he looks. He wants us to have those same eyes, how we look at people as well. Well, when we do that, there are three things that I want to look at today of how God looks at us and how these are the qualities that how we are to line up or so that we can be the man or woman of God's own heart. To become a man or a woman after God's own heart, there are several ways. Again, one of them is you got to have a clean heart. We'll talk about that. One is a committed heart and the other one is a loving heart. So all of these things, clean, committed, and loving, these are the things that we must have if we want to be a man or woman of God's own heart. So the first thing is look at a clean heart. What is a clean heart? Well, a clean heart is first is willing to remove the old fleshly carnal heart and be open to spiritually or, or to be, uh, to, to let me say that again, to be open for the spiritual OK, to receive the word of God so that your hearts may be made new. So the, one of the scriptures that I love when it says creating me a clean heart and renew the right spirit within me. So we have to have a renewing of the heart. But the heart also is lined up with the mind. So we have to have a renewing of the mind because they are one of the same. When the heart, when you're feeling somewhere in the heart, your mind is also it's also comes from the mind. It comes into that place. And so we have to really have a clean heart. If we want to be a man or woman that is a, a, what we consider a man or woman after God's own heart. So let's look at some scriptures. Let's look at what God is speaking to us and what he is saying to us. In Deuteronomy 10 and 16, uh, it, it says, Circumcise, therefore, the foreskins of your heart and be no more stiff necked. The circumcision of the heart means to open it up to God for the removing of all reservations, coverings, the secrets and unbeliefs. And so we have to allow ourselves to be open. That's one of my favorite things me and my pastor talk about. The only way that God can do what he does is to be open. The only way that we can be even drawn is by the Holy Ghost. But we have to be open for that for that to happen. So when we look at this and we look at the circumcision, we think about, let's look at surgeries. And we look at how when, when they do surgery and they do circumcisions and they do certain things, they go in and they peel back the old layers. They peel back the skin and they peel back all of this, this old and, and they, they want to get rid of this thing and all the dead and all the, all the old and, and bad stuff. And then they want us to put the good things and then close it back up. 
And so God is wanting us to get rid of the reservations, the coverings, the secrets. You know, those secret things that we've done in the past. God is wanting us to release those things. He wants us to bring them to him and the unbelief that faithlessness that we have had, he wants us to hand it over to him so that we can start begin to walk in faith, so that we can stand at this time. So guess what? So as we do this, he creates in us a clean heart. He renew, renews our heart and our mind changes and we start our views and our eyesight start to become different. We start looking at things differently. We start hearing things differently. When we look at Psalms 51 and 10, it says, therefore, we must ask God to create in me a clean heart, which we, we talked about the scripture, but it says, and renew the right spirit within me. First John 1 and 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is what? Faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So we have to come from a place. So once we are being cleaned and we're getting our hearts clean, now we have to come to a place of confession. So we have to confess. So we have, we've gotten past all that. We've, we've those secrets and the lies and the different things that we have done. We're confessing these things first unto God. And then the Bible also tells us to confess our sins unto man. So what we have to do is once we have come to God and we have gotten to that place, now it's time for us to get it right with our brothers and sisters. So that what? So that we can move forward. Because when we're holding these things in and we don't release, even if that person doesn't release you, if you have released that thing, guess what? You are free. And when you're free, that means you have been cleaned. That means everything that you have had before that has been renewed. See, and, and this is what God wants us to do if we want to be a man or woman of God's own heart. We have to have a clean heart. We can't have a heart, a hearted heart. We can't have a hateful heart. It has to be clean. And when we think about clean, that means pure. That means righteous. That means holy. Am I telling you that you just have to be perfect? No. No, but God wants us to be perfect in him. In other words, mature in him so that daily as we're going through things, he wants us to release that thing. It's just like a, a dialysis. He wants us to have that dialysis. He wants us to go in and he wants us to clean that thing daily. So as we, you get your blood cleaned in a dialysis, he wants us to clean our hearts. In other words, get those things off of you so that the next day, when you begin the next day, you don't start up the next morning with the same mess on you. He wants us to release that thing so that we can go higher in him. It's all about the Lord. It's not about us anyway. It's about what we do and how we can bring people unto him. You know what I'm saying? And, and it's, it's our purpose to draw men unto him. And so that's what we need to be at. So let's, let's go to the next thing. We talked about a clean heart. Now let's talk about a committed heart. This is one of the things that's hard for most people because when we hear the word commitment, Two words that, that, that run people off is submission and commitment. Submission is, you know, when we have to honor, when we have to obey, is one way to get a person to take off running. Another way is commitment because I was a runner. I was a non-committed person. I was, and, and, and when I say this is committed to the right things. I was committed to do wrong. I was committed to go and be sneaky. I was committed to go and, and sell drugs or do the thing that I was not supposed to do. But the thing that I was supposed to do, I would not commit to. And so God is wanting us to be to have a committed heart. And having a committed heart, let's talk about that. To be committed wholeheartedly is to serve God with a whole heart. That means we have to go hard in the paint, we used to say. That means we have to go to the next level. That means... When we have cleaned that heart, now we're in a place of committing it. That means now we have now God has cleaned the heart. We, we don't want to put the old stuff back in it, like the old uh, wine skins, and try to put new wine in it. He wants us to take the heart and put new things, but things of Him, things that are lining up with Him, His Word. He wants us to put those things back in. So we must now be committed to serving the Lord. So look at Psalms 37, 3 through 5. And this is, I love the scripture. Most of us are very, uh, most of us know what the scripture is, but let's really look at it and what it's saying to us. It says, trust in the Lord, excuse me, and do good. 
Let's look at what they said again. It said, trust. That means there has to be a faith. That means we must believe God. Then it says, and do good. So we can't just have faith in God and do bad. It says, faith, it means trust God and do good. That means live righteous, do what is right in the heart. That's a committed person. So we can't no longer continue the, the old ways, but we are in a new way. So shall you dwell in the land. So it's given us conditions and it's letting us know that as we do, there is a place for us. And see, God, that's what I love about it. He doesn't have to do this, but God always has something for us when we do what is right. When we look at it, it says, and verily thou shalt be fed. Delight thyself also in the Lord. And it says, and he shall give thee the desires of our heart. So if we find joy in the Lord. If we find peace and joy in the Lord, guess what? He said he'll give us the desires of our heart. That means, when I say find a joy, that means we get to a place where we're rejoicing in him. That means no longer are we complaining. No longer are we um, uh, in, a, in a place of, of where we're just in misery or in discomfort. But even when we're going through, we find joy in the Lord. And when we do that, when we delight ourselves in him, that means we find a, a peace in him. He said he'll give us the desires of our heart. I don't know about you, but I, I have a lot of things that God has done for me. And those are a lot of the, my needs have been met. But there are some desires also that I would love to have. And God has fulfilled those things. But guess what? He has even more in store for you. And, and so this is one of the things that he wants to do. So when you clean your heart, when you commit yourself to him, he says that he will give you the desires of your heart. The last thing is his commit thy way unto the Lord. Trust also in him. So it says trust twice. The first in the beginning where it tells us to trust in the Lord. And then the second part, and usually when a person is telling you that, that means it means something to God. Trust in the Lord also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. That means everything, all of those things that you have desired and those things that you desire from God that lines up with him, he wants to bring those things to pass. God wants us to trust in him and have faith in him. When we look at Hebrews 11 and 6, it says, but without faith, what? It's impossible to please him, for he that comes to God must believe that he is he, that he is, and that he is a rewarder for those who diligently seek him. When you are really, um, really seeking God and you're really wanting to change your life and you're really seeking him, guess what? He'll show himself to you. And, and it tells us in here that it says, but you have to have faith. You got to believe that he is. And that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek you. When, he, when you seek him, that means, when, when it says diligent, that means no matter what's going on. That means you're always constantly seeking the Lord. When we used to seek our brother or our sister or our parents for certain knowledge or for certain things, God has said, seek me. I'm not telling you not to have wise counsel or to talk to anybody, but seek me. And I'll point you to the right place and to the right person to get those things that you need. And so that's what's so important when we seek him and when we seek his face and when we find him, he'll give us all of those things that we need. But we have to be committed. And that's the thing, not decommitted, not not running, but going towards. We have to be committed. Let's look at Proverbs 3, 1 through 6. And this is my last one on being committed. And it says, my son, forget not my law, but let thy heart keep my commandments for length, for the length of days and long life and peace shall they add to thee. Let not mercy and truth forsake thee, bind them about thy neck, write them upon the tablet, the, the tablet on thy heart. So shall thou find favor and good understanding in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all thy heart and lean not unto thy own understanding. But in all thy ways acknowledge him and he, should, he will direct our paths. 
So when we look at this and we look at the scripture, I love this first part. And even though it says my son, it's, it's talking per person. It's talking about our, the, the woman or man. But it's telling us, it says, for my son, forget not my laws. So he's telling us today, don't forget about those things that are important. Don't forget about all of those things that I put before you that we should walk. And so as we are walking those things that he had told us, the law that he had told us to walk in, but also he says, for the length of days and long life and peace shall they be added to thee. I don't know about you, but I want more long days and I want peace added unto me. And so if we follow God, he will add and not subtract. He'll give and not take away. And so this is what he's doing for us. And he says, let, let not the mercy and trust forsake thee. So don't let these things get in your way. Don't let those other things of other people that don't trust you or, or craziness that's going on in your life to keep you away from what God has for us. But we have to stay committed. Because see, that's what happens. The enemy loves division. He loves division. And so he wants to divide us because if he divides us, he can conquer. And he knows that there is power in prayer and there's power in strength. It's strength. And that's why it says that two or more gather in, in the name, thou shall, God shall be in the midst. And so he knows that if we continue to come together and we be committed to one another, he's in trouble. What he wants to do is divide us and get us to run and be not committed and not to submit so that we cannot get the things that God has for us. He's jealous. He's a hateful person. The enemy is. And so he's trying his best to keep us from getting the blessings. Look at what it says to us. It says, look, let not your mercy and trust forsake thee. Bind them about thy neck and write them upon the table, the, the, the tablet of thy heart. So shall they find favor and good understanding in the sight of God and man. Not just God, but man as well. He wants us to have these things and we'll find favor in God and in man. And how do I know that? Because I right now, because of the way, and, and I'm not, again, this is not bragging or this is not one of those places where I'm putting myself because I'm still not arrived. And, and I won't ever until I make it into heaven. But I notice that as I line up with God, that I see the favor that God has given me through him and through man. And so this is what I know is to be true. And if we follow God and we trust him, like the scripture says, trust in the Lord with thy own heart. Lean not unto our own understandings, but in all thy ways acknowledge him and he will direct our paths. If we follow him and we stay committed, he's going to direct us and get us to that place where we need to be. The last thing which is the most important is we must have a loving heart. If you want to be a man or woman after God's own heart, you got to be loving. Why? God sent his only begotten son. That's love. That's agape. That's unconditional. It's not a phileo love. It's not eros, uh, uh, um, eros love. You know, it's not a, it's not an erotic love. It's not a fellow, uh, a friendship love. It is a unconditional love. It is a love that he has no matter what you have done or will do. God loves us beyond that. This is what he wants to do. But we have to have that same thing. We have to be committed. We have to have a clean heart and be committed to doing what God called us to. And then in that same thing, we have to love beyond. Look, we have to get beyond ourselves. Even when we feel like this person doesn't deserve love. Because sometimes we can feel that way. Look, I don't like this person. I, ooh, they ooh, get on my nerve. They really work me. You have to love them. Those are the people that God really wants us to love. The unlovable, because guess what? We were once unlovable. There were some people that wish we were dead. I don't know about you. I'll just say me. I know there's some people that wish I would rotted in jail. They wish I would have been. There's so many things that they have wished upon me. But then I have the people who love me in spite of. And I needed that. And we need that. And we have to be the same ones to give that. And so when we are the ones that are called, we're the chosen. We're the kingdom. We're the ones that God has called to another level. That means we have to do what God has called us to do. That means we have to love them. Even when you don't want to be in a room, I got cousins, I got friends or old friends. I got people who I met that I'm not real fond of, but I love them. So it's a difference between me wanting to hang out with you and go somewhere versus I love you. 
And that's the thing. I still need to love you. I don't want anything to happen to you. And if I can help you, I still will. I just don't want to hang with you. You can have that, but you still got to love them with an unconditional heart. So let's look at what God says. Have a heart to love beyond how we feel about one another. It must be unconditional. Mark 12, 31 says, and the second is like, namely this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. So there's two things that God has called us to. God says, look, I want you to love thy neighbor. These are his greatest commandments. He says, love thy neighbor as thyself. And it says, what else? It says, love thy God without, love God with all thy heart, mind, soul, and might. So in that, he's telling us that we first must love God with everything that we have, our whole being. Then the other thing that he's telling us is that we must love our neighbors. And that's one of the issues that we have today is loving thy neighbor. I didn't say the person that lives next door to you. That's not always your neighbor. We're talking about that person that you see, that you walk upon, that you deal with daily, those ones that you work with, the ones that you're in school with, the ones that you walk past, the ones that work your nerve, the ones who your, your sister or brother that you feel like they don't deserve anything. The one who has hurt someone, the one who has murdered someone, the one who has done something that you feel like that they should not get a second chance. We have to love them. That one who has stolen from you, the one who has lied on you, we have to love them. I'm telling you, I'm speaking to myself today because that's one of the hardest things to do. But guess what? When God was on, the, when Jesus was up on the cross and they had stuck him. And they gave him a, a vinegar, I mean, you know, they gave him a sponge and they, and they, and they put the, the, the thorns in his head and they gambled over his clothes. And he said one word that, I mean, one sentence that he said was, forgive them for they know not what they do. He loved them in spite of. He did not, even when, when Peter cut the guy's ear off and they was coming to get him, he said, this thing has to be done. He still loved these ones that were coming against him. We have to adopt this same behavior. We can't have the attitude of the world. We can't live the same way. We can't have the same heart as the world. Or we can't call ourselves Christians. We can't call ourselves believers or followers of God if we can't do this. And so that's why it's important for us to have a clean heart. We got to renew our mind and our heart. The other things we have to be committed and then we have to love unconditionally. Leviticus 19 and 18 says, do not seek revenge or bear grudge against one of your people, but love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. So it's telling us right there. Look, if we believe in the scripture and we believe in Christ, it's telling us do not revenge what's going on. Whatever that thing is, you don't have to revenge it. God knows what he's doing. He knows how to get back. I've had a few things that's happened this last month or so, different little things that has occurred that could potentially make me want to get some get back or snap on somebody. But I can't because I'm a follower. I'm a believer and I trust that God knows what he's doing and he's going to take care of business. And guess why I know? Because he's always taking care of business. And even when I've done, I have gotten back more, you know, even things that I, I mean, I really deserve more than what I've gotten back. In other words, the discipline that I've gotten, I've deserved more. And so, but God knows how to get his people and get people back in line. Let God revenge. Let him do what he does. John 4 and 7 says, beloved, let us love one another. For love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. And let's look at Matthew 5 and 44, because I love this. It says, but I, and this is Jesus speaking, but I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them who despitefully use you and persecute you. Oh, I know I'm saying something to somebody today because this is a hard one because when a person is lying on you, when a person has come against you, when a person has hurt you, the first thing that you want to do is put your hands on them. And some of y'all know that even when I was in the streets and we lived that life, I put my hands on some people. I've done some things that I'm not proud of. 
But that was a different heart. That was a different mindset that I had. Now with love, I'm in a place where I have to, unless you put me in a corner and you're coming against me and I have to protect myself, it's different. But I'm not an offender. I'm a defender of the word of Christ. And so I'm standing on his word and I want to live the way God called me to live. And so if you want to do the same and you want to really follow God, then you have to have a clean heart. You got to be committed and your, your heart has to change. That means you have to have a loving heart. First Peter 1 and 1 22. This is my last scripture, y'all. Seeing you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the spirit unto sincere love of the brethren. See that you love one another with a pure heart fervently. That means you can't have a fake heart. When it's fervently, that means it's genuine. That means it's for real. And so you can't just like, yeah, I love you or yeah, I, I, yeah I'm, I'm good or I'll forgive you. And then in the back of your mind is like, you know, when I catch this person, you know, because they, they got a few friends around you. When I catch up with you, yeah, I'm, I'm going to do this. You can't have that. Or, you know what, I'm going to say I'm sorry today, but I don't, pfft, I'm done. I don't even, I hate them. No, you have to have a heart, a loving heart through and through. Why? Because it's so important to God because that's one of his greatest commandments. And his greatest commandments, we have 10 commandments. His greatest commandments that he said, it wasn't thou shalt not murder. It wasn't thou shalt not uh, um uh, be adulterers. Thou shall not commit this or thou shall not. It says love. Overall, it's love. Charity was his number one because if we do those things, everything else will fall in place. As I conclude, when I look at a man of God's own heart, I look at David, and a lot of us know the story about David. David was a young, um, young shepherd, and he took care of the sheep, and he did all these things, and his his great fame that we know him of is of killing Goliath and cutting his head off and taking it back and you know to them and but the, one of the things that we know about David was David was called as God's one of after God's own heart and people say well how is that because David had did a lot of kind of mischief through his time but God again doesn't look the way how man looks at man's heart I mean how how man looks at hearts and he looks at people, God doesn't look at our heart the same. God doesn't look at man the same way. God knows our heart. He knows the wicked and he knows the good. And he knew that even with David, even when he was doing wrong, he always wanted to do right. He cried out and, and he poured out and, he, and his whole heart was for God. And that's why he said, David is a man of my own heart. Because he knew that David was a warrior, but David loved unconditionally. And he loved Jonathan and he loved others. And he was a warrior, a true warrior. And he wanted to do what is right even at the end. And that's what God is calling us to. He just wants us to be a man or woman of his own heart. In other words, he wants us to get that old thing out of us and get a clean heart. He wants us to commit ourselves to him fully. And then he wants us to love fervently. And if we do that and we do what he has called us to do, then we can say as we leave here, when someone is speaking over us in our life, he can say, we are men or women of God's own heart. That's what I want to say. I want someone to say about me. I want them to say, look, I, I want God to, when he speaks to me to say, hey, well done. But I want, when man is speaking over me and someone is speaking about me, I would love for them to say, man, he was a man of God's own heart. And that's how we should be, man or woman of God's own heart. And when we do that, Guess what? We are pleasing God. God is pleased with what we have done. I'm praying that someone has gotten this word today, and I'm praying that someone has has not just gotten this word, but is is putting it into them in, into action and wanting to do what God has called you to. We know that it's hard. We know that in this world there is tribulations, but the scripture tells us that. We know that there's wars and rumors of wars. Look, scripture tells us that. We know that people are dying around us. Scripture tells us that. That's why we still, we still need to do what God has called us to do, even at this time. So if you want to be who God has called you to do, let's pray. And let's let God back in. Some of us have denied God. Some of us have gotten mad. Some of us have gone to another belief. Or some other things that have uh, occurred in our life where we have just 
come to a stagnant place. Let us pray and let's think about what God wants for us and let's do what he called us to do so that we can really enjoy what life, this life, this last days that we're living in while we're here. Heavenly Father, we thank you. Uh, we thank you for the things, that, even the things that we have seen thus far because we know that things are even greater. You told us that eyes haven't seen nor ears have heard the things that you have in store for us. And so we're waiting on you. We're waiting on that. We're occupying until you come. And Lord, today we're asking that as we get developed and as we live for you, God, we're asking that you would create in us a clean heart and renew the right spirit within us, Lord. We're asking that you would give us a, a committed heart, that we would trust in you and not into ourselves, Lord, that we would lean not onto our own understandings, but in all our ways acknowledge you because you said you would direct our paths. And then we, we want to love like you have called us to love. Lord, condition our hearts that we can love the way you love an unconditional love. Lord, not the world, the, the way world, uh, the world views or, or the way that they love, but the way that you love. Put that on us, God. We're asking you to. Lord, you said if we ask anything in the name of Jesus, it shall be done. But we must believe by faith and we believe today by faith. We're asking that you would shake off all of that dust off, off the people who, are, who have got, gone to a wayward state. Those who have gone to a place of not believing, the, the ones who are, who are in a state of, of just, they're, they're, they're miserable. Lord, we're asking you that you would lift their heads up. We're asking that you would turn that heart around, God, that you would open their eyes, God, that they may see you clearly. And Lord, that you would begin to order their steps and that you would do a great and marvelous thing in their lives. Lord, touch us today, God, as we, as we begin to, to worship you and as we begin to lift you up and give you the glory. Lord, I'm asking that you would just have your way like never before. Touch our families as we're bereaving, as we're going through. Touch the others that are sick in, in the bedroom, in the sick, sick rooms. Touch, touch the ones that are incarcerated. Touch the, the homeless, Lord. I'm asking that you would touch those that are, are jobless, those who are carless, Lord, that you would be, begin to find, that they begin to find their way and that they be developed in you. Lord, we thank you for what you have done, but we truly thank you for what you're about to do. Not just tomorrow, not just later, but right now. We thank you and we love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray and give thanks. Amen. God bless you.